Hello everyone, welcome to the DH Education Podcast, your program to be updated on the digital heritage education domain. I'm your host, Raul Gomez Hernandez, and I'm glad to be here with you. In this first episode, we will talk with Susan Hassan about the definition of digital heritage, the future of museums, the role of heritage education today, and how young people respond to the technological innovations in museums. Stay to the end and discover some innovative projects and books recommendations to explore more around this topic. During the 32nd session of the UNESCO General Conference, the Charter on the Preservation of the Digital Heritage was approved. This document describes digital heritage as resources of human knowledge or expression, whether cultural, educational, scientific and administrative or embracing technical, legal, medical, or other kinds of information, are increasingly created digitally, or converted into digital form from existing analog resources. It means digital heritage is a new type of cultural heritage, as is the unique one born digital. Taking this approach, this new type is real, authentic, and it has its own materiality, and is not a copy of other items, in other words, it has its own aura. Taking this point of view, it could be important to think how powerful is the material aspect of this type of heritage, and how is the relationship with the audience in terms of emotions and embodiment. To know more about this aspect, let me propose new questions. Do we need to take a different approach to get a powerful connection with this new type of heritage? It is only needed to work on putting them into context. Are museums understood as what we know today the perfect place to develop this connection? Are the new generation taking a different approach with reality using new technologies? This week, I would like to talk with Susan Hassan about it. Hello, Susan. Thank you very much for being here in this first episode. Hey, Raoul. Thank you very much for inviting me. Let me introduce yourself a bit to the audience. Susan Hassan has been Emeritus Senior Curator of New Media and Head of the Internet Office at the Israel Museum between 1993 and 2019. She's an evaluator for the European Commission, Chair of the European Network Station, INA, and Foundation Partner from the Consortium for Professionals in the Cultural Heritage and Advanced Technology Sector in Israel. She combines academic research taking a PhD at Goldsmiths College of the University of London, focuses on the impact of new media in contemporary museums and professional practice in the public cultural sector. As I can see, you have developed a fruitful career in the cultural heritage domain, and today is more alive than ever. What is left to be done? <laughs> What's left to be done? Uh, we have to start from the beginning. Every day in our field and our sector of digital cultural heritage is a new day because as much as we've done, as you mentioned, I started in 1993, which is a long time ago. Um, every year, there are more things happening in our field. It's, it's moving forward really fast. And for example, what we used to do maybe three, four years ago on pretty se uh, serious computers, you can now do on a smartphone. So if anybody wants to do 3D or, v or, or AI, or all sorts of interesting um, applications. All you need to do is download the app. You can do it yourself. So this is switching um, the impact of what museums have been doing over the years to what individuals, visitors, people can be doing on their smartphones. And every few years or every few months, you'll find something else that's moved to smartphone and moved to uh, a platform that is so easy to use that anybody can create new content for their digital heritage collections. So what's, what's there to do? Well, it's a start up all over, all over again. And those who have um, maybe started 10 years ago have to rethink what they're doing. Those who started before that have to reboot and build the collections again. Uh, legacy collections online all need to be rethought. And the, the whole of the sector is shifting really quickly, which is good. I think that's a good thing. That's a really interesting reflection about the present and the future of digital collections. Connecting to your background as a researcher on digital heritage, what do you think about the definition from UNESCO and the debate around authenticity? Does digital heritage have its own aura? 
Oh, this is a good question. Luckily, this has been debated and resolved many, many years ago, so we don't have to keep bringing up this, this old question. Um, is, is digital authentic? Is uh, the virtual museum a real museum? This has been discussed years and years ago. So it's not really new, but there, there's been a process here. You mentioned the UNESCO charter. Well, there's also the ICOM um, definition of a museum, and that was changed in 2004, which is quite a long time ago, um, and taking into consideration not only tangible, but also intangible heritage. And in that clause, it's called the Barcelona clause, which, which actually was passed by um, ECOM in um, Korea. In uh, the, the, uh, the, every four years, there's a very large conference there um, on, in ECOM. And this was the clause of the Barcelona clause was there added in, which included not only tangible, intangible, but digital cultural heritage. So it's very, very much a real um, entity and, and something the museums have been dealing with for, well, at least 16 years, I would say, 17 years. Um, trying to kind of define a virtual museum has been a bit of a struggle. Um, I've been involved in a number of projects. Uh, originally, we worked with Vimast, it was a, I think it was a three or four year project a few years ago. And we, put, we created a definition of the virtual, the virtual museum and you can actually read it in Wikipedia. Uh, and that was revised a few years later with the, the, multi, the VIM, the multimodal project. Uh, which we, re we revisited the definition of a virtual museum and I actually uploaded it to Wikipedia and I kind of keep tracking it to make sure that nobody's over edited me because <laughs> I think uh, uh, people misunderstand this and it's, it's actually very simple. Um, so yeah, the VIM project um, and the links in Wikipedia point to that have a definition um, of the virtual museum which is a pretty open definition, so we don't need to worry too much about that. So this is all kind of history. You know, it's all so much on the table. Um, there's, no, there's no reason to, to ask these questions anymore. Is it real? Is it authentic? Is digital okay? Yes, it is. It's been around for a while, and we just need to do it faster, quicker, with a lot more AI. Yes, I agree with you on how authenticity and reality are not terms to discuss today. As UNESCO definition says, Digital heritage is unique and born digital too. Following what you say, I believe it's important to update the concept of museum to an open and not exclusively a physical place, like digital platforms where users are part of this museum, share digital experience together. I don't know if could be the correct solution, but do you think we will have the same emotional connection with virtual exhibition than in-person ones? I just want to qualify something you said about the unique object. Um, the problem is uh, when you're on digital, there isn't such a thing as a unique object. There's a, a cloned object. There is an object that represents the unique object in the museum. There's only one Mona Lisa. There's only one Rosetta Stone, for example. The unique object resides in the museum. And the only way you have a virtual museum is if it's embedded, in my opinion anyway, embedded in a physical museum and the real collections. So you can have an echo of a museum. The footprint is the physical museum and the um, documentation or the representation or the interpretation of the museum in the digital is exactly that. It's not unique. So in my opinion, you can have wonderful experiences. All my professional life I've been creating um, experiences for the digital museum they can be fun, they can be rewarding, they can be engaging, and they can be in the palm of your hand on your uh, iPhone, on the fact, connected in uh, remotely to that object that's sitting somewhere in a museum. And you have to believe, you have to trust that uh, your digital represent representation is connected to a real object. Otherwise, there's no point in the concept of a museum. A museum, um, in, as a place of entertainment or interpretation or, um, or fun uh, in the screen, in the digital, is only that. And in my opinion, the, the unique object, the physical object in the, uh, the real gallery can't be replaced in any way. And unless you have that, you can't have a true digital meaningful experience. Yes, it's the aim of anyone to have a meaningful experience with digital heritage. 
Hybrid systems, where you have physical and virtual aspects together, are really good options. But I don't agree with you in the concept of museums. What I understand from a virtual museum is an environment where you have experiences with digital objects who could have a physical representation, or only digital artworks born digitally. The connections we have with digital objects are totally different in the way we approach them and how we experience them. For this reason, I understand digital heritage is not duplicated, as you can feel new emotions and explore new aspects with it. A great combination could be to integrate the digital aspect in the physical place, as you say, but the virtual part of museums should grow to have their own digital experience too for the audience. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. When we're talking about art born digital, okay, that's a completely different category. And yes, absolutely, it doesn't matter that uh, where you're seeing your art experience, it doesn't matter where you are, on a local screen or on a large screen or on your television or in the cinema even, or in a, an electronic billboard in the street, um, it's art that's born digital and it has a completely different ontological status in the world. You have the digital um, object that being replicated in the digital, which are not unique. And yet you have the digital art. Again, it's not unique because you, um, you can see different versions of it. You know, a computer can duplicate it as many times as it wants. It doesn't really matter. Um, the core uh, experience uh, is, is not unique at any level. Let me just explain that, that point, actually, something that happened to me as a professional artist a few years ago. Uh, I exhibited in a gallery uh, just outside Jerusalem um, in an exhibition called Transparent and Fragile. And uh, we had a whole series of objects that were glass, they, was, they were fabric, um, they were transparent and they were fragile. And I used a computer to, um, to showcase my application. Uh, it was a hand, it was a hand driven app that you can uh, that the visitors could actually press buttons and the um, the computer was was showing my uh, my nine and was nine little vignettes on uh, a silk screen which was blowing in the wind it was like a fan behind it and it was moving the whole time so it was light sitting on a white silk sp space the, sp the the silk was moving all the time the sound was coming from the computer and that was my version uh, it was called a time machine I think so we cr I created that for, the, for this exhibition, which was fine. And it was open just a few days. And then something really terrible happened. There was a fire in the gallery and everything. And that exhibition burnt to the ground. It was horrible, actually. Um, when I went to see what happened like a couple of days later, when the police let us in, all that was left of my silk, my projector, my computer, um, and the blower behind, and the sound system, was like the hard disk and a big kind of blob of black glass that the, uh, the screen had kind of melted down to on the floor. So that was the end of my transparent and, uh, and, and I thought aesthetic experience. Okay, that was the end of that. Um, but then what happened after that is interesting. I then went, I went to, with everybody else in the exhibition, those who had shown glass, those who had shown silk and, uh, ta and textiles and other transparent and fragile exhibition objects. We went to the, the um, insurance and we asked for a compensation of what we'd lost. Okay, and the, the insurance company told me, well, we'll pay you for your computer, we'll pay you for your um, uh, sound system and even that piece of silk and the, and the little fan that was blowing to me air, but we can't pay you for your artwork. I said, why not? That's the most important thing. They said, well, it's an artwork. You could have made a copy of it and a copy would have been exactly the same. And I said, well, I didn't make a copy because that was the only version that I had. Well, they said, well, you know, too bad. <laughs> You've lost your only copy, but potentially it's very easy to duplicate and copy and back, and back up. And that kind of separated for me what was the essence of my artwork. It was the physical you know, attributes, the objects that uh, made it happen. But the actual content, I have a video of it somewhere, so I can actually see people interacting with it. So I do have a footprint in memory of it. But what was left uh, was not the artwork. And because I hadn't back, backed it up, I couldn't retrieve it ever again. So that kind of made a separation for me. You know, what is digital art? And it kind of hit me in the face, actually, <laughs> what I'd done.
Does that, does that explain things? That's a really great example, turning to another issue, new approaches in education, so a more social and collaborative aspect of learning. Can museum education help us to develop this connection with digital heritage? Um, well, I've watched people in the museum, in the Israel Museum in Jerusalem, I work for many years, and I've watched people use the gallery, use the artwork, or use the you know, archaeological collections, it's an encyclopedic museum. A lot of people visit um, individually, but a lot more visit in groups, groups of two, groups of families, groups of friends, or in tours. And the whole point about this kind of experience is it's a social experience. Uh, and that's very intrinsic to the museum experience, that you come to an embodied physical experience, you move around the gallery and you move around with others and you discuss things, or at least you have, uh, you share body, body language or eye contact if you're not yet actually speaking. So the individual sitting in front of the masterpiece is unusual because most people visit in groups of at least two. So when you start moving this to a computer and you start putting an art experience either on a smartphone or on um, a monitor, like a slave screen, if you're in a gallery, the moment it becomes a singular mono experience, you've lost the quality of the museum experience. Collaboration and working with a team, thinking together, walking together, experiencing together, is critical to the museum experience. So any, um, in, in our museum, we're looking at VR. And if you look at VR in the museum gallery, the moment you put on the, the visor, you put your goggles on, your glasses on, you're cut off physically from the people around you. You're cut off from the people that you probably come with in the museum and you're in a singular experience. Now, that's what is traditionally used in, in museums at the moment, this kind of singular experience that you and the monitor, or you and your VR system, if you're lucky to have one, um, and it's, it's a, a very solitary experience. And in my opinion, it's, it's to the detriment of a museum experience. You don't really want to do things on your own. You'd like to be with others. Um, I've seen some wonderful collaborative VR experiences when you have the equivalent of maybe four or five people all reacting and acting together within the framework, the behind their glasses. You know, they're wearing a full body suit um, and they're being um, tracked in a, in a very specific space using the VR. When you bring back the interaction with others, you're bringing back the, the magic of, in my opinion, the, the magic of the museum. You're sharing your experience with other, others. You're sharing the wonder with others. So that's happening, but it's a bit complicated because the full body suits are cumbersome, um, they're expensive, they're difficult to manage. They take time for each group to come in uh, and, move and put them on and kind of practice and fumble around a bit. But when you get there, then the, then the experience is worth it because then you have a group experience. And that to me is the essence of a museum experience. So if you're sitting at home, another way to do it, sitting at home uh, and playing a group, a game together in an online site. I mean, all the kids now around me and everybody and me, actually, I like computer, I like video games, but don't tell anybody. Um, you get pulled into a shared space online uh, and you're there meeting with other people. Till now, the graphics are kind of mm, okay. That Fortnite is obviously a lot better. Animal Crossing is really cute for kids. Things like that are wonderful as an engaging space for social interaction. So once you take it outside the museum and you put them on the shared space um, in, on web space, and, and then you have a social interaction, then the magic happens. And what is good about Fortnite or Animal Crossing um, and previously in um, the 3D space, 10 years ago, everybody went into, once you're shared, sharing that space with somebody else in real time, then that's bringing back the museum uh, aspect of collaboration and social interaction. And I think that's something that will, will grow um, over the years. That's, that has good potential to resonate with the museum experience. I believe in this concept of virtual museums, where any visitor can interact with anyone sharing their views and learn together, as they are doing now with distant learning and not necessarily to experience it alone. It's a way of integrating and understanding what professionals in museums do with visitors. Yeah, I completely agree with you. You know, the key to all this is bandwidth. It's basically, do you have decent Wi-Fi? Do you have a decent uh, sound system? 
and can you really spend time in, this, in these spaces that uh, is meaningful to you? I mean, I've watched kids play Fortnite for hours and hours and hours and how engaged they are. And I don't like the violence in Fortnite, but I think the way that uh, small groups work together and uh, support each other and they build together, they build a map, um, they create their own island and they come back to it and it's uh, it's a potential space. I think this is really good, but this is not a museum. And if you look at um, Animal Crossing, it brings in parts of a museum experience in the fact that you are creating a collection um, and you, you're putting the collection in your house or you're hanging it in your house and creating an exhibition. That's a museum quality museum experience. But the moment you start collecting art, like again, Mona Lisa, Rosetta Stone, you're only collecting a clone, um, uh, an image of that. But if you go out to the Animal Crossing seashore or something and you collect shells uh, or you collect plants or trees and create an, ex uh, um, an exhibition that is not, well, it's also duplicating the real world. I'm not saying you're actually picking up shells or picking up flowers. But there's a different quality to that. It's not trying to take a museum as it, in the entirety um, and putting it into the virtual. When you, once you start putting up virtual pictures of the Mona Lisa in your living room and you all go to each other's houses in Animal Crossing and you see everybody has the same virtual Mona Lisa, that's, that's pretty depressing. But if you have a, an, an individual kind of shell collection or you put, um, I don't know, some trees in your garden that you've made a decision and you've chosen um, that's more individual so there's a bit of a trap here in trying to create a virtual museum i would rather go to uh, th there's different components here one is the collection aspect one is the social aspect and then once you start putting in art objects then you're sort of pretending you're in a museum i would rather be in a museum rather than see it in the virtual on my wall in animal crossing for example Apart from the spiritual walls, we have wonderful digital collections of cultural heritage on the internet. Taking for example Europeana collections, what do you think we can learn from these platforms? Yeah, let's talk about Europeana, absolutely. Um, there's different aspects to a digital collection. There's the image, uh, which may or may not be usable, but at least you can view it. And there's also the metadata. Uh, I hate the term, let's go to a museum and learn or teach or whatever. Um, I don't believe in learning or teaching in a museum in a formal way. If you go around a physical museum, it's enough to sit by the masterpieces and just look at them, enjoy them, look at the brush strokes, look at the, the color combinations, look at the details. If you just go to like a Mark, Mark Rothko exhibition, okay, a sort of minimalistic um, kind of exhibition where you see um, if there's many of them, you, you, can, you can sit and almost meditate uh, just looking at the art. You don't need interpretation. You don't need, certainly don't need education. You need to be there and you need to enjoy it. Now, you don't get that when you go through Europeana. You, you get the knowledge from Europeana. You get the metadata. You get the substance of uh, the information, um, the history, um, the explanation behind it. And that's the quality that you can um, enjoy when you look at Europeana. You can pick up... Um, objects and you can compare them, you can bring them together and you can create uh, collections for yourself because you see the connection between one object and another from one period maybe or one art school to another and you can, you can do that. Um, but I have to say this and I'm going to say it again and again, there is no way that you can replicate or improve on the physical museum. Looking at the digital on any size screen, even if it's a massive high definition screen, um, that you'll happen to have in your local cinema, there is nothing that can um, replace looking at an art world, art work um, when you're standing by it and you're measuring your physical self to the, uh, the artwork in the gallery. And you think that somebody, some person somewhere took a paintbrush or, or a, a spachtel, what's that called? A, um, uh, and, and started working on the canvas or started sculpting in, in marble. Somebody did this at some point. And the language of that human hand on the marble or um, on the canvas springs out to you and you're, while you're standing there or sitting watching it. And that is irreplaceable. You're not going to get that anywhere. What you will get with Europeana, for example, 58 million objects available to you, is a very broad range of wonderful 
um, historical um, kinds of work and kinds of the, uh, the artistic hand that can, you can learn from, you can study, but you probably won't get that mesmerizing wonder that you get when you see the original. To end this talk, could you give a tip or a recommendation to our audience to engage with digital collections? Um, well, with European, you have so much available to you. You have so much at the finger, your fingertips that I would say uh, search on the terms that you, um, you already know and love and you can discover for yourselves. But if you are a teacher or if you're a researcher, you can have a look at the galleries and the collections that the curatorial staff and the editorial staff have created for you in Europeana. So they've already done the kind of the legwork, you know, they've put together the objects, they've created the thematic connections, um, and I would say go and have a look at the exhibitions or create your own exhibition. Um, and read, and read, and read, and read, because you're not going to get uh, the magic out of a single image by looking at it, but you will get the depth and the understanding and the context um, of the metadata, of the textual explanation that's included and uh, enveloping each of the objects in Europeana. So go enjoy the exhibitions and collections. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk with you and develop together a better perspective from another point of view. Thank you, Ralph, for asking me those very difficult questions. I hope I gave you suitable answers. If you would like to learn more about the current debates on digital heritage, I recommend you this week a book where Susan Hassan has participated on it, published in Mid Press and titled Terrorism in Cultural Heritage, a Critical Discourse, edited by Fiona Cameron and Sarah Kinderdin in 2007. To take an approach around how digital culture is transforming museums, the book published in Springer, titled Museum and Digital Culture, edited by Tula Giannini and Jonathan Bowen in 2019, is the perfect choice. If you want to know European projects working on social aspects, I suggest you visit the Culture Labs project website. In this project, researchers are developing tools for participatory engagement, evaluating impact and using digital cultural heritage for social inclusion. Another powerful project is Citizen Heritage. This project aims to develop tools to stimulate engagement between cultural heritage and young people through experiments in cooperation and participation of the audience. Thank you very much for being today with Susan Hassan and me in this episode. Next week, a new expert will come and a new topic will be. If you like this podcast, subscribe to the YouTube channel, share with your colleagues, follow the podcast on Spotify, iVox or any platform you listen to and follow the project on social media.